In this episode, we are going to have a chat with Matt Eager about his play-by-mail adventures, and I talk about the positives of virtual gaming. Welcome to the Mythrust Matters podcast, Season 1, Episode 27, Mailing the Adventure. And welcome to Mithras Matters, a podcast dedicated to the Mithras rule set and all its supplements. As always, I am your host, Inwills, and welcome to August. I'm currently on vacation from work, but that doesn't mean that the podcasts and the videos are on vacation as well. I have wondered in the past whether I should have a month off from Mithras Matters, one month every year when there is not an episode. I know I did it during the first year, but this was purely by accident since I actually lost track of the time and had to publish a humble apology. What do you think? Should we have one month off or not? I guess during August, most of us are on vacation, so maybe we have a little bit more time to listen to podcasts. So that's not a good month to have no episode at all. I do think about Christmas and December making that a no month podcast, but I really like doing the Christmas special. Maybe we should just stick to one every month. Maybe it's just easier. Keep me in a routine. I've recently shared some ideas about topics for future episodes with the Design Mechanism team, and they have all been approved. So some great content on its way. I also have an Evernote page with some ideas for what I call a solo episode. These are when you just have to listen to me for the whole episode. These usually occur when I haven't been able to secure an interview for the podcast or I simply do not have the time to secure an interview, complete it and record it. I must admit, these are probably the hardest episodes for us all. You know, I have to write out the whole script for the whole 20 to 30 minutes and you have to listen to me. Anyway, the list for these flying solo episodes is getting longer. So hopefully, as well as some great interviews in the future, I will be able to make some solo episodes episodes which are both informative and interesting as the other episodes that we have. But let's not spend this whole episode looking ahead. Let's focus on the present and let me share with you some of the positives about our virtual gaming setup. Probably like the most of us, I started my RPG life huddled around a table in someone's house, rolling dice, moving metal figures which were expertly painted, I have to say, laying floor plans and being a GM from behind a screen. I have to admit that the last time I played like this was when we did a 24-hour charity Advanced Dungeons & Dragons session for Rag Week at university. Although I have still got all those floor plans and figures, our games have moved away from the face-to-face environment to a more virtual setup. Rather than talking about the negatives of this approach and the reduction of face-to-face interactions, I would like to share with you some positives that I have found with the more virtual approach to gaming. Although you might think it is easier to get people together in the virtual game rather than the physical one, you would be wrong. 
but the virtual game does allow for a wider range of people to join. If I was playing a physical game, then three of our four players would not be able to attend at all. Longshanks lives in the UK, the same as Medivac and myself, but at the other end of the country. And Mr. Pickles and Captain Kangaroo live across the Atlantic Ocean in the United States of America. Time zones can be an issue, the same issue that I overcome for interviews for this podcast. But with careful organisation, it can work. Of course, real life can often delay a session, but that is the same for any game, I think. I have watched virtual games when people roll dice off screen. I'm sure that the majority of us would be completely truthful about our dice rolls if they were off camera. But I have seen some games that have I have been amazed when all the important roles seem to have come up nat 20s. Maybe I'm just being cynical. Many people would say that they would miss the physical rolling of the dice if they were playing virtually. Personally, I don't. And from the reaction of the players when those crits are rolled, I don't think the players do either. For me, the ease of being able to ask Roll20 to roll specific dice combinations with or without modifiers is rather nice. For example, when rolling for experience rolls, Roll20 will remember your dice rolls, so you only need to enter them once and then you can use them again and again and again. Also, with the character sheet set up in Roll20, skill rolls are so easy, and I've even made a macro to work out the value for augmenting rolls. Although saying that, we did become very suspicious of the macro I created for the hit location that always seemed to come up with the right arm. While sorting out some old papers and folders from my advanced Dungeons and Dragon days, I came across my old D&D log. This was a book where I would actually record the adventures in full. It is really great looking back at some of our games, some which were just between me and my brother, me DMing and my brother cont- controlling a full party of six characters. One aspect of playing virtually is that I really like the option to record the sessions. This allows us not only to provide content for my YouTube channel, but also provides us with a record of the session for a player who might have missed the session or for people who want to go back and find out what that name of that barkeeper was. This is especially useful for me since I often make up names on the spur of the moment and then promptly forget them. Am I the only GM that does that? My final positive for virtual gaming is the wealth of tokens and maps that are out there. Often I would have to spend considerable time making detailed maps to share with the players or use floor plans that never really communicated the atmosphere uh, effectively. I am not sure how much I have spent on the Royal 20 marketplace purchasing floor plans. Often this is a spur of the moment thing when I suddenly realise that I'm going to need some plans for the local castle or starport. I'm personally not very artistic, so find it hard to create my own and like to think that I'm supporting others who have the skill and talent to make wonderful floor plans that I then purchase. Coupled with the artistic content of these plans are the effects that can be used alongside them. Dynamic lighting is brilliant, especially when the party are exploring with only a couple of torches and a stiff breeze blows them out. The players literally see nothing at all on their screens. Hopefully that has given you some positives for playing virtually. And if you have any questions about playing virtually or Roll20 or any other aspect of virtual gaming, then do reach out on forums and or Discord and I'll try and provide some answers to your questions. I 
was lucky enough a few months back to be invited to play on an online game that was similar to the play by mail method. I wanted to share with you all the possibilities of this method of playing and so I grabbed Matt for a chat about how he set up his campaign. Over to you Matt. Well, I'm Matt Eager of Old Bones Publishing. I, uh, I've been playing role-playing games for on and off, gee, I guess it's 42 years now. Wow. <laughs> on and <laughs> off. I started young. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've been playing Mithras almost exclusively for the past almost 10 years since it's been around. Fantastic. And, um, so, you know, I've studied the system a lot. I'm, I'm an author. I've written gaming supplements and adventures. I've worked with design mechanism uh, directly on an adventure. And so I'm fairly familiar with the rules. So I, I, I'm in a good comfort zone. Mm. And uh, recently, I've, <laughs> during the pandemic especially, I've um, been looking to keep on gaming like we all have. Yeah. And so I, uh, after playing in a friend's play by post online game for a couple of years, I thought it might be interesting to learn how to do that from the GM side. Brilliant. So, I mean, obviously the, the pandemic really has hit that social interaction, that real life social interaction that we have as gaming. So was that the, the main um, consideration when you decided to set up this play by mail? Um, it wasn't the chief consideration. I had already tried play by mail um, before the pandemic set in and I enjoyed it. Um, we can talk about that in a bit, I guess. Yeah. Um, so when the pandemic came along, it just kind of made it that much more natural to try to do it this way. I, uh, like so many of us, I feel like I spent half my life on Zoom and meetings. So um, I, I haven't done too much of that sort of gaming, although I have done some uh, with Google Meet, actually. Right. Um, and that was a mixed table where some of us were sitting around the table at my house and others were in two different locations uh, wow. coming via Google Meet. And we had a, a laptop with the screen at the end of the computer like they were sitting there. They could see us and we could kind of see them. <laughs> that's, that's a real hybrid approach, isn't it? Having yeah, both. It, was, it was kind of fun because we all knew each other in real life already and, and hadn't played for a while. So it was good in that sense. We didn't like, you know, have to get to know each other or anything. Yeah. We just sit down and, and start. The, the but, wonders uh, of technology that could bring us together like that to play a game. Absolutely. So you, you mentioned earlier that you had played in a play by mail before. Okay. So what was the appeal? What, what did you enjoy about that system then? Um, I, I feel like I've said this many times in different venues, probably on Discord, but um, I think that I'm a much better writer than an actor. So when it comes down to pretending to be someone in writing instead of pretending to be someone in voice and mannerism, I think it's more in my wheelhouse. Right. So, you know, I, I enjoy that. Um, I also like, as weird as it may sound, as, as a game progresses and adventure progresses, I like to go back and reread it and come through. And it really is like reading a, a short story. Mm -hmm. Except the interesting part being, you know, that you you wrote part of that, you know, part of that is you in there, but it's not all you either. It's some it's other people as well. So you still get that collaborative vibe, but it's not the same as which for many people, I guess, would be kind of painful. It's not the same as sitting down to write a story and then reading it when you're done. Yeah. It's much more natural for us role players. And so it has this interesting. Um, this interesting side and also it has the side benefit of everything's written down so you don't have to wonder about that that clue that you found you know four scenes ago you can go back and check <laughs> <laughs> so it saves me from having to keep so many notes which i like 
Yeah, f- fantastic. And I, I've been lucky enough to be involved uh, with this play by mail. And you, it's housed on, uh, I think it's called Tavern Keeper. Is that what it's called? Right. Uh, I use, um, I, I have mostly used tavern-keeper.com, right. which is a nice, uh, simple, but functional pay what you want platform. They have a discord channel, so you can go check it out there if you want and, and talk to people who like to use it. It's rather straightforward. You can, um, it's system neutral. So it doesn't explicitly support a whole bunch of uh, different systems with like rules integration or, or pre-built character sheets. But to be honest, I'm a minimalist, so mm-hmm. that doesn't really bother me. It has a built-in dice roller. It has, you know, um, you know, you can set your avatars for your characters so you know who's actually talking in the role play part. It has places to set up chapters for role playing, and it has places to store your character sheets. What I what I do is I drop a, a JPEG of a character sheet in there, format it the way you want it, mm-hmm. and then just plop it in place, and you don't have to worry about creating tables and stuff. They have a system for it, but it's a little clunky. And if you're just going to be looking to see what your skill score is anyway, and then using the dice roller that's in place, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't really need to be clicking on a button on a character sheet and yeah. having it tell me whether I failed or not. I can I can work that out. <laughs> yeah. And one of the th- um, aspects of the play by mail and, and tavern keeper that really, and I've, I've never said this to you, so be aware. I... I, I think the the way that you can put other NPCs in it by changing the picture. And mm-hmm. I was never sure when I started who was actually a real person behind the characters or who were you narrating different people. Does that make sense? Right. Um, if you... If you want to find out who that is, you you either have to remember or you can go to um, there's a, you know, a, a page with all the characters linked to it. And you with each character, in addition to the character sheet and any notes you want to keep, there's a played by so and so link. On. Yeah. So but yeah, it um, it can be difficult, especially in a large game to, to keep track of who's playing who. Sometimes, sometimes I have to go and check myself. Yeah. But I, I, I thought it was really good. I really, because I think when you had NPCs, you sort of like talked by with their picture. Is that right? There was right. sort of like your main narrative, but then if an NPC spoke, right. you changed the picture. Right. Each each player um, owns a character. Yeah. And yeah. so in. Uh, the GM owns all the characters who aren't, you know, PCs, all the oh, NPCs. Yeah. And so, yeah, um, if if you were running two PCs in the game, then you would also be able to change your avatar for whoever you were playing at that moment. So yeah. it would be it would be more obvious to you if if you had that ability. But in our game, you're just playing one person, so yeah. it's not obvious. And and I think I really like that aspect of it because. Like I said, sometimes I wasn't, I didn't know whether or not the NPC I was interacting with was another person playing that character or whether or not it was you as the the GM. Because I really like, it has a sort of like a a conversational style, doesn't it? How how you see it on the page. Right. Yeah. It's, it's reminiscent of, um, uh, at least the last version of uh, of iChat that that used to be on yeah. the app with a, a balloon and a balloon and a balloon and a balloon, yeah. you know, interspersed left and right. So yeah, it um, <clears throat> I guess it can be uh, a little weird uh, to tell exactly who's talking if if you're uh, if you're if you're not sure. Yeah, I I really I really like that aspect. Did it take a a lot of time to set up? No, not for me, but I was already kind of familiar with it because, you know, I had been using it for, for I don't know, two, almost three years before right. I, I tried to be the GM with it. So I had a, a, a good um, 
a good comfort zone with it already. It wasn't that difficult to learn. I, so I would encourage anyone who wanted to give it a try to check it out. And like I said, it's pretty minimalistic. It has features that you don't even need to use to be able to conduct a game effectively. I think it even has voice and video integration like wow. more familiar platforms like Roll20 or whatever. But I, uh, to be honest, I don't know how well um, that works. So, so this is one, um, that's one aspect that I've, I've also been toying with. I'm running another game right now on Discord um, using, using just it in a very simple way, you know, setting up a server with a bunch of channels and that some of the channels have the character sheets in them yeah. and some of them have, you know, role-playing chapter one, chapter two, and one for background info and one for like general talking or I'm going to be away this week or something like that. So that was very straightforward to set up. Also, the hardest thing about that was getting the the a dice roller bot integrated. But yeah, Raleel was very helpful there. So <laughs> kudos to him. <laughs> so did you have all the adventure written, and then it's a case of cutting and pasting it into the into Tavern Keeper when scenes change, or do you create it within Tavern Keeper? Um. <clears throat> It's yes, I did have uh, the adventure that we were playing um, all written up already. So yes, a lot of it is being able to cut and paste into place. But of course, you never know as the GM exactly what the, mm. the PCs are going to say or do. So there's there's still the creative aspect of the actual role playing in there. Just like if you were sitting around the table, there would be parts of the adventure that you might read aloud as setting or background material, yeah. but then, you know, you, you'd finish that paragraph and all the, all the players would be looking at each other and then someone would start role playing yeah. and knew it was time. Right. Yeah. So it's like that. And it, there was, I, what I found also really beneficial were, was your use of imagery in the, the pictures that you put into uh, above the na narrative that sort of like introduced scenes are those just imported just like yeah. a, a like a normal wordpress a, a oh, word yeah. processor yeah. yeah you can find all those images online you know use google images or pinterest or or whatever you like to access pixabay and stuff like that yeah um the uh one thing i should say about tavern keeper is i have not played around much with um, like uh, an integrated uh, tabletop for like battle mats and tokens and and tactical combat like that. I know some people really like that very much. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of in between theater of the mind, narrative combat and tactical combat. What I tend to do is I tend to hand draw a map and put a JPEG of that in place and, you know, with like a labeled grid. And then I would say, okay, tell me where your guys are standing to begin. Right. And then I would, you know, get everybody's input, remake a little map of that and put it up there and say, does that look right? And then as the narration goes on, if I need to redraw it again, I'll do it. Yeah. But in general, in general, it's fairly easy. As long as you have some simple reference uh, for like line of sight, oh, you wouldn't be able to see what's going on there because it's around the corner or, yeah. you know, the monster's too big, you can't squeeze through there, stuff like that. Yeah, and it, it's something that we're toying with and discussing a lot at the moment in the, in our M space campaign hmm. um, because I, I don't like having detailed maps out because I, I feel that the the narrative is lost because it becomes far too tactical you know how far can I move one two three four five I'll go behind this random object and we're we're ex we're trying to do this theater of the mind but I I think I need to get to grips with ranges of weapons because the the first thing the players ask me is so how far away is it you know, because their yeah, it, guns have different range right. bracket, brackets. A better, yeah, um, it would be kinder of your players to say things to you like, is it close enough for me to shoot? And I think it really yeah. does change a lot when you're talking about more modern 
firearms based stuff you know it's a lot of melee combat in sword and sorcery yeah exactly yeah. yeah how did you how did you do it with call of cthulhu did you i i seem to recall a map and yeah. then you would just talk mostly yes the we, when we did um call of cthulhu adventures there was a map to show the layout but right. it was never used as a, a tactical floor plan so it was more to give and i must admit in the call of cthulhu adventure um i used imagery a lot more so there, there's a classic um in the gaslighted adventure there's a bit when uh one of the patrons gets impaled on a of like a, a railing an iron railing so right. i use the imagery of that rather that actually added to i think the narrative description but also the atmosphere of, of the setting rather than um tactical maps you know i i, I think call of who lends itself more to that because really there's not a lot of combat well <laughs> there shouldn't be <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and i think it's a lot more of a, a narrative based you know i i for me personally i think it comes down to combat often leads to that need for a tactical representation you know right. and and i think that's when players sometimes want to see where they can go or you know and how far they can move etc so and i and i think it's it must be something really difficult in that play by mail sort of like environment and i'm really interested you know it's it's a different way of playing as as i know but there must be some positives what what do you really like about it because it you've got your tavern keeper and then you almost like replicated it in a discord what, right. what are the positives of that that's sort of like style of play the positives are i think um i think it lends itself it, it promotes better role playing mm. i because for me personally it lends me more time to think about what i'm what i'm going to say or more importantly what this character would say and do in that situation so on the one hand, you know, it's a double-edged sword. One of the fun things about sitting around the table with your friends is that there is that improv character to it. Yeah. And you never know exactly what's going to happen, but then suddenly it's happening and you need to react. So, you know, that's very, that's exciting and fun. And I think that's one reason that we, uh, a lot of us play mm -hmm. RPGs. But on the other hand, <clears throat> I, I like this, I like the slower play by post aspect because I think that you get, you get more authentic role playing. If I don't like to use pretentious terms like that, because I think some <laughs> people, I think some people are just way too into it. Right. Yeah. Um, but I, for example, you know, if I'm if I'm the GM and I need to role play four different NPCs that you're going to meet in the first couple scenes, it's easier for me to give each one of them a slightly different voice mm. by having them use slightly different language. I don't have to sit there and like, you know, squint my eye and try to make a funny accent to try to accomplish that. They, they can have a different manner of speaking that maybe you different vocabulary or, or something else that comes across differently. And it, you know, my villains don't all end up sounding the same, maybe. That, that kind of thing. What are you I, saying I, here, Matt? What are you I, saying about... <laughs> what I'm saying is I'm a much better writer than I am actor. <laughs> <laughs> Point one. Yeah. I, I know all my villains end up sounding like pirates or... Yar, yes. So, yeah. <laughs> or we, we have a county in um, England called Somerset where they talk as like farmers with a, a sweeping generalisation. So it's either pirates or farmers for me. They always seem to <laughs> come out there. And I, I really do like that, that aspect of that time delay or that lag or that that ability to sort of like really think about how 
a player character may react or how an NPC will react to that um, that action that a player character does. But do you not feel that sometimes because there's so much time, it becomes difficult to either keep everything together or remember what's going on? Yes. Um, from, well, I, I have a few things to say about that, I guess. Um, from it. the GM side, I think you need to be really familiar with your material. Uh, for me, if I'm running one of my own adventures, I mean, I, I wrote the damn thing. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I hopefully have a good handle on that. I mean, it's, even so, players can do unusual things sometimes. And so you have to be ready to react and adapt. Okay, fine. Um, but your baseline has to be uh, a good familiarity with what you're running. Now, of course, again, the good news for that is if you're done playing for the night and you leave it at a nice cliffhanger, you have several hours probably until yeah. you resume to go and study up on the next piece of the scene. But if you were sitting around the table, you would have to be much more fluid. Mm. So, so I think the, the players may think that the GM has a much better command of the situation perhaps in this play by post format. Wow. Um, from the player's side, I think it might be a little frustrating sometimes. So you really have to, um, it's, and it's not everybody's cup of tea. Uh, I, I recognize that. So it's really important to find a, a crew who are all on the same page and are, you know, they all enjoy it. They have generally compatible schedules, more on that later. Um, and they, um, they're comfortable with maybe waiting around for a day here or, you know, someone going on vacation for a week. Um, so it does, it does require a certain mindset, but given that mindset, um, it's fine. It's good. Yeah. Uh, scheduling. Um, sometimes you'll, you might have players from all around the world, um, in the in one of the games I just ran, uh, what did we have? One one person in England, one person in uh, on the East Coast, one person on the West Coast, I think, and one person in Australia. Wow! Wow! <laughs> and a so few different you know, time zones there, <laughs> right? So, you know. Our Australian friend uh, would, would be around like mostly in the mornings, maybe, which would be yeah. evenings for him. Uh, but then the rest of us might do a bunch of stuff uh, in the interim. It can get a little annoying for combat because, you know, combat really is supposed to be like bang, 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 bang. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, it's not so bad for that either because... Um, it's easy to keep track of rounds and cycles and whose turn it is when you're going straight in order. Like at the table, you might have like a whiteboard or maybe an iPad with yeah. an order on it and just go down the strike rank order that way. Uh, in Tavern Keeper, you can simply, you know, copy and paste the, the same thing periodically in, in the long thread of, yeah. of comments that you're writing and say, you know, it's so-and-so's turn now. What do you, what do you want to do? And you might have to wait for a role here and there or a decision about which special effect because you didn't know what you were going to win. But you can get used to declaring things in advance, too. Like, if I win a special effect, I want to choose bleed. And yeah. then if it comes out, you just say, oh, great, fine, no problem. So, again, these are the kinds of rhythms that as you go, you, you begin to develop. And it does, it does help to make things smoother. Yeah. Well, one thing, and I must have been, well, probably still am the worst person to have in a play by mail because I do, so, do <laughs> I do so many other things and I'm trying to sort of like fit it in. And one thing that I, re I, I've, I was that person in combat that must have been a nightmare because the <laughs> combat was going on and I had other things in life going on. I was going to say, I'll just crouch behind in the 
in the chat. My character, just for, um, I'm trying to justify this now. In the sense <laughs> she, wasn't really, she wasn't really a combat expert. So I think- uh, she It was just, completely in character for her to be crouching yeah. down, trying not to get lanced, yes. Uh, exactly, <laughs> but I, I could really see it that point that you know when you want that combat you really need that period of time when people are engaging one after the other and right. um, one of the bits that I really enjoyed was and still enjoying um, was when the storyline split up and I and my character was left at the house and I think the others went off to a village what did you was that part of the adventure or was it something that you thought oh this is going to work better because of people's schedules at the moment no that was part of the adventure actually <clears throat> like um like a call of cthulhu adventure there was an investigative phase and so it's natural to break that rule about never splitting up the party. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, which is a rule, not a law. So you can do it just at your peril, right? Yeah. But, and you know, you were there. In this particular case, it didn't seem like anyone was in mortal danger or anything. So, you know, you didn't worry so much about saying, I'll go yeah. do this and you can go do that. Yeah. And I, I really like that because sometimes I, I was feeling that if other people were interacting with the story, I had a lot of reading to do. And then sometimes I felt that something might have moved forward and I might have wanted to put something in there. Does that make sense? But because of my delay, it was sort of like a little bit out of it. Yeah, there are sometimes, um, there are sometimes when uh, it gets a little bit awkward and either someone can get left behind by accident and in which case um, sometimes as the GM I'll call for a pause essentially yeah. I'll say I, I think that this character would probably want to you know interject here so let's let's give them a minute right and a minute of course might mean 12 hours <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, yeah um, yeah but yeah there are other there are other times uh, when the opposite happens when everyone thinks it's someone else's turn and so nothing <laughs> happens. Uh, if you were sitting around face to face at the table, you could look at each other and use body language and say, you go, no, no, you go. And it would be worked out in five seconds, yeah. but it, that might again, turn into 12 hours. <laughs> yes. so I, I thought it was in Wilson's turn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I, 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 I think when I was sort of like just interacting myself with my character and the surroundings I found that a lot more appealing and I really liked that aspect of it you know because I just felt it was a one-to-one -one conversation between myself and you as the GM mm -hmm. and it, it seemed to be at that point to flow a lot better for me as a player while beforehand there were other people coming in I, I, I spent a lot of time reading and I totally agree with your point. It reads like a novel. It really does. And some of the um, the other people's um, narratives and their ability to communicate their character through really fantastic use of language, you know, and yes, it, it was really absolutely fantastic. And I spent a lot of the time just reading it as if I was reading a, a novel. Right. You know, go, going backwards and forth. It, it reminded me a lot about the, like the fan, fighting fantasy books, if, if you remember those, in the sense that I was actually part of it, but there was a lot of narrative there as well. So right. we, we, we've talked a lot about various aspects. Was there anything that you either as a player or a GM that you really thought was negative about the approach or, or anything that you thought, oh, it, this area really needs to be developed to make it more effective or more of a gaming, positive gaming experience? Um, yes, and that's one of the reasons also why I wanted to try another uh, platform like Discord. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, in part just to try new things to see, you know, to see what was better and what was worse. There are small things that I like better about each of them so far. Um, one of the things that play by post doesn't get you is that social sense of seeing someone else's face. Yes. And, you know, the, I mean, on the one hand, you avoid Zoom fatigue because maybe you do that at work all day and you want to break from that. But on the other hand, maybe you really do wish you were sitting around. Um, so like we said about the time zones before, the good thing about playing online, whether it's play by post or interactive, is that you know you might have met people on the Discord and you know you just like talking to them and you think hey you know let's invite this person to my game and uh, you're getting along great and then you find out yeah this person lives halfway around the world or yes. or this person lives a quarter of the way around the world and it's it can be really awkward and so um, the good part about online gaming in general, not just play by post, is uh, that you get to you get to game with people that you would never be able to sit down at a table, yeah. with, a real table. So that's obvious. Um, getting a little bit of that social aspect into it is something that I hope Discord would make easier because it has famously good voice and video. It seems to behave for everybody yeah. under almost any circumstances unlike some other things I've heard about, like Roll20, for example. Um, okay. I've had good experience as a player with Roll20. I don't have any complaints about that, so I don't want to say bad things about them. I've also enjoyed um, some of the uh, gaming that I've done on, what is it? Um, it's just flown out of my head. Give me a clue. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's the one that uh, that Nigel likes to run, for example, for his Mythic Babylon game, uh, found, um, Foundry. Right, yes. Right. Foundry. That one's pretty good, too. I like that. And that's voice, video, tactical maps, as tactical as you want to make them. Nice. So that's that's the whole nine yards. So I enjoy that. So one of the reasons, sorry, I keep going around in circles. <laughs> One of the reasons I decided to try Discord would be so that if there were like four people who happened to be around and we did have a really interactive scene and it was a Friday night and we were in the mood to, it might just be a pickup situation where you'd be like, hey, nice. do you want to turn on voice and video? And then we could. So that's something that we haven't actually done yet in this Discord game of mine, but it's something that we could do and I do want to try it. Nice. So players out there listening, let's think about that when it's convenient. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Right? Let's hope they're listening. That's right. That's right. You should be listening. <laughs> yeah. There will be a quiz. <laughs> yeah. So anything else that you would like to develop more? Or looking back, you sort of like thought, that didn't really work. I like the idea of the Discord, and I really like the idea of suddenly – having some written narrative, but also having some sort of like in real time um, action discussion. I think that would be brilliant. Anything right. else? Um, looking back on uh, some of the games I've played, I do think that it's, and you never know until afterwards, so, mm. so be it. But it really works 10 times better when you have a crew that is all on the same page and used to play by post gaming yeah. and, and people who know it's their cup of tea, as opposed to you invite someone new and after a little while, they're like, yeah, sorry, I'm not really feeling it. Or yeah. my schedule just got crazy and it's not really going to work for me in terms of consistency. Mm. Um, you know, no harm, no foul. I don't blame people for that. And you, you know, you never discover whether you are a lover of this format until you try it. So yeah. you have to try, right? So I don't blame anybody for it. But um, what I have discovered is that when it really does all click together, it's very nice. Yeah. So and the only way to find out if that's going to go with a certain group of players is to try. 
and it's a shame when it doesn't pan out, but when it does, it's really enjoyable. It's, yeah. it's really nice. And, and I think there's a, almost like a, a double-edged sword there in the sense that play-by-mail or this way of playing almost allows you to engage with it if and when you have the time. So it might be very a very good system for people who can't dedicate a, a set evening for two hours or three hours an hour. But at the same time, that is a negative because you never know, especially if there's a group of people, you're always waiting for that person to contribute or the game moves on and that person is being left behind because so much is actually happening. Right. If, it's a, it creates a sort of a, a social dilemma for the GM, because like I said, there are some times when you want to, you feel like you should throw in a pause. Yeah, and then yeah. there are other times when you're just, you're just practically begging for someone, yeah. <laughs> someone to do something, you know, it's like, wow, it's been a week. Everybody. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I, I can imagine as a, as GM or even as another player that at times must be very, frustrating you know and i i think sometimes the what i was uh, missing myself was and i think your idea about discord really remedies this is the banter between players and i mean players quite specifically rather than between characters right. because i think when we're around a table or even in zoom there's that certain banter and i really like when when i'm gming with the in crowd a lot of times we talk about things but it's not the characters are not actually doing it we're just sort of like exploring possibilities and right. I, I think that is something i admit i don't know the the other people who are playing in our campaign you know if you put them in a lineup i would not be able to pick out who they are and that was something i i missed i i really like the the narrative between us as in the gm and myself but i i i miss that player play or that player gm banter and i think discord your ideas about discord and those sudden one-off sessions you know would really remedy that very much so i hope so yeah the um the discord game is still you know in its beginning um but it has been really good for that so far and i for each okay um technical stuff in tavern keeper you have uh you know speech bubbles essentially where different characters will talk and do the role playing and then literally behind a speech bubble there's like a there's like a little a little icon to press at the lower right that will yep. reveal reveal the out of character stuff that you can use so you can have your banter there but it's like behind the yeah. actual um speech i and really so, like that i i thought that was really good uh, yeah uh, i like that too um oh and something that you pointed out that never occurred to me before but was actually i'm worried now matt i'm worried when <laughs> A key observation that you made was um, when you do dice rolling in Tavern Keeper, um, the result is not revealed unless you click on the little dice roll oh, yeah. uh, link there. And I always just click on it because I want to see what happened, right? But yeah. as you pointed out, um, from the player's side, if you don't want to know whether your character succeeded or not, it's like the GM is rolling behind the screen. Yeah. And you can you can avoid knowing whether whether you got a critical or a fumble or something like that and that like gives some more authentic role playing so yeah. that was a that was a key observation i i, I really, really like good. that because I, I think as a player and i very rarely play so my playing skills are sadly lacking across the board <laughs> but i think if i don't know something i really i react better uh, you know, and so if I'm making a role and then the GM sort of like says this happens, then I'm going with it. I'm not thinking, yeah. oh, I failed that role. Right. Yeah. The GM says to you, you have absolutely no doubt that this dude is telling you the yeah. truth. You don't know whether you got a crit or a fumble. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I really like that because I'm, right. I, I find it's, the role playing is more immersive 
I, I don't know how well I've done. So I'm just going with it, which I think can lead to some very interesting interactions and encounters because you literally don't know whether or not you've made a mess of it or not yes. <laughs> you know you'll so, only know after the handcuffs get stuck. Yeah. <laughs> yes uh, precisely <laughs> so what advice would you give to anybody who's listening to this and thinking oh i really like that idea of play by mail to either get involved as a player or to set it up as a GM and to actually start their own campaign? What advice would you give them? Um, Discord is free and yeah. Tavern Keeper is pay what you want, which means it's as cheap as you want it to be. Yeah. So it's not like you have to go sign up for a year's subscription and you know also access to this compendium or whatever. Um, so the barrier to entry is pretty low in terms of monetary outlay and, and online rulebook outlay. You don't have to worry about that. So if you're interested in it and you want to try it, start off small, pick a very digestible adventure that you're familiar with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, get to know some people on the Discord and, uh, and set up a game and invite them. And if you want some you know, specific advice on doing it, I'm on the Discord often, so just ask me. I'll help you out if I can. Fantastic. Yeah, one thing I'm interested in, on the Discord, how do you monitor that conversation? Because it, it must move up right. very quickly, and it's not necessarily clearly assigned to those speech bubbles like in Tavern Keeper. Is that an issue as it sort of like scrolls down the conversation? Right. It's, it's not as much of an issue as you might think. So no. um, going back to what we said about the Tavern Keeper speech bubbles and they flip over to reveal the out of character conversation. What I have for each role play chapter of the game in Discord is I have one channel for actual role play yeah. and one channel for OOC chatter. I call it. Got and that's that. where all the, the fun stuff is happening, where we're talking to each other. Ooh, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that kind of stuff. Um, and it's very separate because it's in a different channel. And, it, you know, you know, Discord will, will beep at you when something happens. So if you walk away from your computer, you'll hear the little whoop in the background or, yeah. or you'll get a, a note on your phone if you wait long enough that something happened. You know, you can... Um, if you want to call someone's attention in the out of character chatter line, you know, you just say at in wheels, I need a role here or exactly. something like that. Yeah. And it'll flag them. And in discord, there's a feature where you can change your handle on yeah. a given discord, but not universally. So if you're in the Mithras discord, you can still be, you know, Matt underscore E, yeah. but you can call yourself GM or your character's yeah. name when you're in the uh, the role playing, you know, the games Discord. So I found that very useful. So it's easy to keep of which, keep track of, of which PC is talking if you just change your handle for that one nice. Discord. Yeah. I guess it's harder for the players to keep track of which NPC is talking because they're all me, the GM, but it's it's not that bad. No, and and I think there's ways around that, and you sure. know, I I think, you know, players and GMs are highly adaptable. We we adapt, you sure. know, and and I think so. I I think yeah, um, definitely get in touch with you on the Discord for any advice. And are there any sure. slots open for people to join your games at the moment? The I'm only asking, of... not for myself, you'd be pleased to know. <laughs> but, you know, there might be some people who are listening who are thinking, I really like to give that a go. Right. My, um, you can always ask. I mean, what's the worst thing that happens? I say, no, not right now, but I'll keep you in mind, right? Yeah. Um, there's, uh, I, I intend to basically always have at least one online game going. Right now, I have the game that we're, we're doing with you on Ta Tavern, Tavern Keeper and yeah. some, some others out there. You know who you are. Um, that one has... That one has... Kind that of sounded a bit... <laughs> you know who you, you are. You know who you are. <laughs> you know. Um, 
Uh, that one is kind of spun down to quiet for the moment, but uh, you know, this is the good thing. We can spin it back up yeah. now that it's summertime and maybe people's schedules are a little different. If you're on an academic calendar, summertime might be good. Yeah, I mean, next, you take vacations. next Wednesday. Next yeah. Wednesday is when my annual leave clicks in. So that'll Excellent. be it. <laughs> okay. um, the other one that I'm doing on Discord, one of the one of the other aspects that I wanted to experiment with is um I have I have seven players or something right now. So wow. I'm feeling maxed out. I wanted it, I thought it was gonna be maybe as high as 10. I invited a whole bunch of people. Some people couldn't manage it. And so we ended up with seven. So I feel kind of locked at that. But this was meant to be a push for me. I have this, I have this idea in my head that if we were sitting around the table, don't have more than six players because then the the, the scheduling entropy gets way too difficult yeah. and and you can never actually meet. Uh, with play by post, I wanted to experiment with that and see what the limit actually was. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever GM'd for more than five, maybe six people sitting around the table at once. So this is new territory for me. I don't know if I'm up to the challenge, but we're going to find out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think that that's absolutely brilliant. And I think there might also be um, GMs out there who are thinking at the moment, oh, I would like to give this a shot, you know, mm -hmm. and actually set up a Discord or a tavern keeper and actually try to do it. So uh, if there are people out there, then yeah, the Discord is a really good place to um, advertise that and sort of like say, you know, I'm thinking about doing this, who would be interested? And then I'm sure that there's always that um, wonderful looking for a game, uh, channel right. in in the discord you know sure. so i'm sure there'll be people who are are willing to you know put their hand up and say yeah i'll be up for that which would be fantastic sure um another thing that i'll point out is some of what you've mentioned that you liked very much the one-on-one -on -one kind of aspect when you felt like it was like just you and the gm yeah i also um began but have pretty much suspended a one-on-one -on -one game mm -hmm. sometimes you see people who who ask questions like can you play mithras one-on-one -on -one with somebody what about single player games and things like yeah. that and um especially if you have you know <laughs> stranger danger <Yeah. laughs> especially, especially if you have just met someone on discord and you know you think they seem pretty cool but you don't really know them and maybe they live halfway across the world yeah. and, and you are a little bit savvy about putting yourself out there or not on social media type stuff yeah one of the questions always ongoing is discord social media i i think it is a very particular type well, we've talked about that yeah um, i think it is yeah i would go with it you you may not be personally comfortable with you know, doing voice and video with someone that you Agreed. don't really yeah. know. Or maybe you just want to do voice, but not video or something. Or Well, this kind of play by post thing is a very kind of safe, friendly, yeah. neutral way to get to know somebody. Very and I think people advice. tend to be on good behavior. Yeah. When they do this. And, and that's one thing that growing up when there was just myself and my brother who played, Mm -hmm. the role-playing games it was either i had to have six characters that i all controlled you know in a party or that one-on-one -on -one. and i there's a lot of fantastic fiction out there when there is that solo character it's not unusual at all in fantasy yeah. fiction you know I mean, and think I, of like Aragon, for example. Yes. I mean, for, for God's sake, it's basically all told from his point. A lot of young adult fiction is like that because yes. it makes the self-insertion into the story very easy and natural. You very know, much you, so. You're yeah. seeing it through this person's lens, and you're meant to you're meant to slip in and and feel 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 yeah. the thrill of sneaking uh, along the cliff or whatever. Exactly. You know, it's natural. So, uh, and and I think. If I ever get round, if I ever find the time to do it, I think that would be that one-on-one, -on -one, that solo gaming aspect, that would be something that I would definitely explore 
in this medium is, is this way because I think it lends itself very much um, to it. Yes. Thanks as ever, Matt, for coming on this show and talking about play by mail. And I'm sure there'll be lots of people. I think I think you're going to get a lot of requests now. <laughs> so so you might have to change your upper limit. <laughs> you know, you, you did if say, you think you hate it now, wait till you play it. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks so much, Matt, for coming along. It's been oh, I'm really glad to anytime. I am really enjoying playing through Matt's campaign and I must say that it has inspired me to start my own Discord game. What this will be, I am not sure, but it's definitely on my list to do in the future sometime when I get the chance. Remember, if you'd like to share anything with the podcast, then why not drop me an email or message me and let me know what you would like to share or chat about. I'm always looking for reviews or interviews with people. So if you are interested, then you can email me at inwills at gmail.com or send me a message on the various forums and discords that I frequent. And that's it. Another episode of Mithras Matters completed. Don't forget you can check out all my content by following me on YouTube and also the campaign areas on World Anvil. I really appreciate your support and do check out the Tapper Talk forums as well. There are some great people there sharing their ideas within the discussions. So until next time, have a great month of gaming and I will chat to you all again in September. Until then, I hope all your opposed worlds succeed and provide you with a well-deserved special. Thanks for listening, everyone. See ya. Bye. The content of this podcast is covered by the Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. So please give appropriate credit if you are sharing or copying any part of this podcast. Thank you.